had a really great discussion in June. As I said, it was it was uh, it covered a lot of different topics. So I think uh, what Ken and I would like to do today is uh, get some of your thoughts about uh, priorities for research that uh, the 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 center could undertake in the first couple of years, uh, you know, maybe immediately and then over a somewhat longer term, maybe three to five years max uh, as priorities. Uh, and maybe we'll start with that uh, and then uh, like to have some discussion, a separate discussion about this hub idea and what could be done uniquely there that wouldn't duplicate but would add value to other efforts. And uh, Ken, anything you'd like to say to help get us started here? Yeah, you know, one, one thing NSF had asked for was also long term, you know, five to 10 years. And, and this, this area is moving so rapidly that it really doesn't make sense to go beyond five years. I think, I think what we should recommend is as you start to get to that four, year four or five, you reevaluate what's next, ne this coming next, because I'd say it's just a really fast growing, uh, fast growing area. And I think we'd be remiss if we just said, hey, there's, we, we should focus on 10 years from now or five, eight years from now. So really what we want to do is, is ask, look at what are some of the most pressing areas that we should look at initially as far as making sure we're helping to jumpstart the whole concept of an innovation ecosystem. And uh, so I really want to get your thoughts on, you know, really some of those, those, those most pressing areas we should be looking at. Thanks, Ken. Thoughts from the group? Five years is a long time. <laughs> Five years is a long time, <laughs> Frank says. Five years is a long time. So that's yeah. where we're looking at starting at year one to two, maybe year three, we'll start the next batch that will we'll take a couple years to put in place. And after that, you know, it's it's really hard to project what's the next uh, emerging innovation we should be thinking about, or where, where's the next biggest challenge. Let let me throw out a, a general area and some subtopics that we we got into in some detail. People brought them up at the June workshop, and, and get your thoughts about whether any of these deserve priority attention. That's around the whole uh, area of data management data privacy, data ownership issues. Um, one thought was this is an area where university research could, could plow some new ground and, and help the industry. Uh, and there, there were some, uh, some specifics on that, but let me just throw that out. You know, data ownership, data privacy, a lot of, uh, Utilities are reluctant to put data out, make it available. Uh, researchers have a hell of a time getting access to information. Uh, and, you know, there are all kind of legal agreements need to be signed. And even if you can, you know, scrub the data out of any identifying information, it's still a bear to get any information. So how are we going to scale this up massively to have data sharing uh, anyway, I'll just throw this out as uh, one area of research that there was a lot of interest in at the, at the workshop. Hey, Dave, this is, uh, this is uh, Sam from uh, Red Zone Robotics, actually. So what was funny, we're, we're actually a spinoff from Carnegie Mellon years ago. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Red Whitaker. Yeah, well, Red, shout out. So Red, red, shooting, red shooting for the moon. I said, Red, let's, th let's focus underground before we go to the moon. So he's, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he's trying to... But uh, I, I can tell you, just from uh, from Red Zone, we, have, we kind of have a unique position. Um, you know, like like we've been the technology been used like in over 500 cities, you know, uh, across North America. And and what, what what we see a lot is right now is just in our case, we probably have amassed over 80 million feet of infrastructure underground. And it's how do you manage that data? And to me, the next big leap's going to be into um, AI and predictive failure. You know, how how can you predict uh, when these pipes are going to fail and those sort of things. So a AI uh, uh, taking all that data, crunching it and figuring out, you know, when pipes are going to fail, what's their duration. And, you know, we've seen out of, again, 80 million feet, age is a 
indicator, but not always the best indicator for failures. Pipes that are installed five years ago are failing, whereas ones that were 100 years ago are, are in pretty good shape. So, yep. um, you know, one area that's going to really breach is people have limited budgets. And how do you kind of get that baseline assessment and then kind of figure out, kind of predict? We can't predict it, but at least with a good certainty of when pipes are going to fail and what are those predicaments look like. So um, that to me is the nirvana because that's that's where the big money is hmm. happening when these un, un, unknown failures occur. And now there's, the cities are spending millions of dollars, whereas if it was a little more preventative and they had a little bit more intuitive information, they can uh, be more proactive rather than reactive. Yeah, and one thing about AI is that it really requires a pretty robust data set to be able to do good AI. And I think it goes back to Dave's first question about data privacy, data ownership. If we really want to do large scale AI at a national or even regional level, we have to have these large data sets that are, have, have, are, are attached to events and, and then we can start creating those tools. But it, the, the key is getting, is getting access to having, having enough data, reliable quality data to be able to do that, to start that process. Oh, we're, Go ahead, oh, Mary. Just going to say, uh, there are a few different data players Ken's aware of, like OSI Soft and Aquatic Informatics, who bring um, the data together. And also a, a company called um, um, it, RiskFootprint.com. They're doing uh, the aggregation of data across um, all of, um, Ken, it, just saw you nod if you know who they are. They're doing yeah. uh, assessments for any property, any area. So leveraging the folks who are in the business of doing the data aggregation and keeping it clean and siloed and structured may be a way um, they might want to partner because they get the university advancement, but then uh, you get the data clean and yes. structured. Yeah, data cleansing is a really important part uh, we're, we're just about to start the Water Research Foundation Urban Sewershed Project. And, and for the six demonstration utilities, one of the things they wanted was stronger data cleansing techniques. Because it, it's all about, from their perspective, trust of the data by the operators and utilities using it. And if, if it's not cleaned and they're making decisions on bad data, then ultimately technology is gonna is gonna fail just not because it's bad because it's not giving them what they want. So I think data cleansing as part of the data man, privacy piece is really is really important. Those two are interlinked, I presume, somewhat, Ken. Right? Uh, I, yeah, they definitely are. Just just gonna throw this out there, uh, Dave. Um, one of the most recent experiences I've had is with some small utilities and all the things we're discussing seem way outside their reach. Um, just the basic infrastructure for uh, a decent and reliable and safe IT setup. Our, our company, Ken would know, is is we, we will start off with a, a set of racks and configuration and engineering that's upwards of a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, and a lot of our smaller utilities, are, they're not even in the game if they can't provide that. So, how how do we address that? Yeah, Steve, that's a good point. One one thing that's actually getting a lot of traction now is data as a service, where where um, and it works a couple of ways. First of all, they can come in and bring in all the capital cost, and the utility will pay for the data as, as they get it back, process data. Uh, and that's even gone to another extreme, like in the Ganji River in India, that they only get paid if they give them good quality data. So not only did they have to put the equipment in, they have to maintain it. Uh, the Alta has to make sure they're giving them good data. They, so it's it's a risk that I've seen some of the big companies taking now. But it, it does help those small utilities actually get into the game and pay more of a, a monthly or an annual pre annual cost opposed to putting up a big capital outlay because that, that's a deal killer. You know, I haven't seen that, but that sounds interesting. Have them basically lease the IT or the OT equipment. Is that yep. what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, yeah as, as we move into a um, uh, 
sort of public-private partnership world more frequently, uh, and particularly within uh, sort of software as a service, uh, the upgrades are so constant. The application of sensors, um, what you know, there's there's a dirty secret in smart water. It's that everything breaks, and smart <laughs> utilities are not immune from that. Uh, you know, Ken, your your opening comment that you know clean data is is the holy grail. You know, my data scientists tell me there's no such thing as clean data. All data sucks. It all needs to be filtered. It all needs to be cleansed. Um, nobody, if you really want to talk about need for clean data, you should talk to people in the aviation industry, uh, particularly <laughs> the, the Boeing Max disaster. Uh, exactly. <laughs> that was a data disaster, by the way. That was... Um, they 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 read the data wrong. They built the wrong thing around the wrong data. Uh, so I, I think what 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 popped into my mind when you were mentioning this, you know, that you started at data management, privacy, and ownership. Um, I think we need to go back to first principles and say what data are we getting and how much of it do we need. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's this belief that we just need as much data as we can get and the data scientists to do the analysis and that eventually this will solve our problem. It won't. Um, I think we need to go back and understand why we want the data, what we want the data on. And that really comes down to, if, if we're talking about innovation ecosystem, we need to talk about what it is we're, we're monitoring, um, what the, what the nature of the data is at the outset that we want to see in, in the decision-making and an analytics and decision-making that we want from that data. That's, that's, I think, the first case. Now, Kevin, that's a good point. You know, when we, we host the CIO um, annual conference of the 35 largest water waste water utilities, and we've been asking them how much data you actually process, you collect, they go about 10%. Yeah. So when I talk to the utility about becoming a smart water utility, I first thing I said, let's take a look at your, your strategy, your vision, and let's look at the data you've already collected to find out what are you doing? And before you start to put in systems that are, are gonna collect terabytes of data. Uh, that you won't know how what to do with. So it's really it's really the f fundamental part is um, you know what is that front end strategy and and Dave actually talked about it in his in his uh, presentation about sort of a digital maturity model. Where are you in before you actually want to jump into this process of being this super smart utility? Are you prepared for it? Uh, not just uh, from governance, from workforce, and from technology. And then start to build off that process. But too many utilities, the you know, city council hears about something, they go, go buy a hundred of them. <laughs> Staff buys a hundred and they go, okay, they're, they're in the closet now. What do I do with them? I think we want to get away from that part and start to go back, say, go back to the basic principles. Um, I, what do you do? I, what do you want to do? What do you need to collect? What problem are you trying to solve? I just, I just want to jump in and, and say one of my favorite complaints is everybody wants a dashboard, but nobody tells you what to put on it. You know, it's a very common <laughs> request. Oh, we want a dashboard. Yeah, of and, course. And, but, but to Steve instrument that, <laughs> we're happy to. And, and what happens is you can, or somebody way back at the beginning of the job has a vision. And by the time, you know, I'm the last guy there, the SCADA guy, and they're like, okay, well, what do we do? And, and you end up making your best guess. And the people who do it are so far removed from the design or the implementation. It's the last guy to touch it. And yeah. or Steve, and, Steve I, I should have done this at the beginning with everybody and I'll make sure we go through everybody. But Steve, could you say, give your affiliation? Yeah, I'm, I'm at Jacobs as well. I, I, uh, I don't really know Ken, but we've crossed paths. I'm a SCADA, uh, instrumentation kind of I'm a dashboard guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks. So Thanks. It, it's just I guess if I sound a little jaded, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Steve, it's it's a good point. You know, we're we're involved in a number of projects and and the first thing we insist on is that 
we want we want every discipline from this the organization that's going to be involved in this project their day one because we want to make sure and and same with our team if our team's going to have a skated component that person has to be involved in it because if you don't have everybody involved you're right at the end of the project someone forgets or doesn't understand where it came from or what what the purpose of it is so you know you definitely have to have this interdiscipline team put together to be able to to create the right the right um ultimate solution for them well and okay. dashboards just dashboards just a visualization tool it's not it's not what it's not all the nuts and bolts behind what they need <laughs> well is it uh would a fair summary be that in in the the data management ownership uh, challenge that uh, research could help identify the, the, the key questions that should be asked about goal for data collection and management enterprises. Uh, and, other, and the research could develop a framework for uh, a framework for planning what you want to collect and why. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Uh, this whole this whole front end strategy framework is, I think, is a, is a would be a really important tool for for organizations to have, so they can okay. actually actually can get those basic building blocks up front identified. I, I Ken, I just want to mention I recently needing to do an energy modeling system and not having uh, data from the pumps. You know, we don't as a matter of course, always instrument stuff in a certain way. And maybe, maybe there's a role for standardizing that. Every, every motor nowadays should have KW available or additional parameters, so. Yeah, no, I tell you, yeah, I agree. There's, there's some, yeah, there's, that's one thing we'd love to have is more standardization in the smart water area, because if you look at the cellular industry, they've done a great job standardizing between chipsets because they got together day one and figured out we have to make this interoperable. Otherwise we're all going to probably fail. So there, and that's, that's probably something we can look at in terms of how did they accomplish that to, and, and start to start going down that pathway. And that's one thing the digital twin working group is trying to do is standardize that process not necessarily the algorithms that's sort of the secret sauce of different groups, but really the process and the components to you. Uh, so they're all very similar. Other ideas for priorities. Mike Starr, looks like you have something you're ready to tell us or suggest. <laughs> I'm still stuck on what Kevin was saying. Mm. Uh -oh. I, I've, used to be the director and before that the chief engineer of the portland water bureau and i'm a really practical guy and all of my SCADA types say collect every piece of data you can collect and i stand back and say prove it what am i going to get from it well we can collect it Tell me what I'm going to get from it. What decision can I make off that piece of data? Well, I don't know right now. Well, guess what? You're not spending the money to collect it. <laughs> the first thing that Kevin said that resonated with me was clean enough. And I'll give you a simple example. You know, we have water, Portland has about 2,700 miles of pipe. And like most cities, it started off small and it got bigger. So we inherited water systems that had data of varying quality. But we got into asset management in a big way, and people want accurate data on pipe life. Well, the data is not there, and they were feeling hamstrung because they didn't know exactly when the pipe went into the ground. And I would say that's kind of baloney. Every city goes through that. Every water utility goes through that. How are you going to move on? Because you can't afford to go dig it up. It costs a fortune, drives the public nuts. So what do we do? I told them, stop talking about this. Go back to the county. Find out when that development was built. That's your date. It's good right. enough. Yeah. Because the standard 
deviation of a pipe break for anything short of my friendly construction contractor putting a backhoe through the pipe is pretty <laughs> wide. So how clean does the data have to be? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's not probably just, not very clean for pipes. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's yeah, it's more of a level of accuracy, and, and you're right. In certain areas, the the um, the the level of accuracy can be very broad. Like yeah. like if you look at if you look at uh, looking at risk analysis from earthquakes, it's really facilities built before or after 1997, because that's when the standard was put in place. So I mean, there's 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 a really broad level, but I think when, when, when Kevin's getting into it, we start talking about real time data coming in, that in regards to the sensor, that's, it's all dirty. And it's got to go through a cleansing process to clean up before you can actually use it to make decisions with. Yeah. But I, I agree on, on the, broad, the broad information about utility, it doesn't have to be to the exact date, February 15th, 1944. I don't think that's going to matter. <laughs> yeah. And, and Mike, to your point, uh, you're right. So, like, uh, what we do is, you know, we kind of pioneer the, the it's, it's not the data cleaner, it's what kind of data are you getting. So, we do, like, a lot of multi-sensor inspection. So, in our, our case, a lot of CCTV, right, which is visual. Um, but we also, when you do sonar or laser, we're actually getting measurements, wall thickness, how much pipe, you, pipe is remaining in that wall. If that was a 12-inch thick pipe and it's corroded six inches, well, you know, now that goes into the, there are actual measurements that you can actually plug in. Those are real numbers. Um, that you can base data off of rather than guessing. Yeah, right. age, uh, depth of pipe flow, but actual conditions. So that, th those are, it's not only clean data, but what kind of data are you getting? Is it measurable data? Is it useful data? Um, and that goes into the model to help make those decisions. Well, there's operational data and in real time, and then there's static data. And, and I, you know, this is what Mike was talking about was, you know, the, the difference between static data and real time data. Um, and I, I, more importantly than, than just data per se, um, you know, I, we really need to step back and say, okay, what, what is this data being collected for in the first place? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if we are in, you know, in, in our world, data is an evaluation of effectiveness. Um, you know, if you're a meter, an AMI person, then obviously that's billing data. Uh, you know, you can have data on workforce adjustment uh, and, you know, or, or data on, on efficiency. I mean, they, just to talk about data, I think really is, is too polyamorphous for us. And that if we're thinking about innovation ecosystems, we're gonna get lost unless we start to put some boundaries around what this discussion actually refers to. And if, if I, if I want to play the bad guy here, I'd say this is a one water conversation and that everything that we should be talking about must be drilled into the point of how do we break down silos within utilities and between utilities and client bases to create one water. That is our goal here. And, and innovation must be towards the party's mandate, call what you want, you know? Uh, yeah. But I mean, it's because it's so easy to get lost in, in you know, clean data, you know, versus static data, blah, blah, blah. It, it really comes down to, you know, asset management uh, took a massive leap into the realm of reality with real-time data. Um, that was a massive improvement in terms of workforce allocation, in terms of budgeting and a variety of other things. It, it came with a huge cost in terms of how do we collect and manage and, and like analyze this data and then put it to good use. Um, but but the, the, the objective was we wanted to accomplish something that data gave us the ability we believed to accomplish better than we could accomplish before. Uh, you know, real-time sewer monitoring, you know, lets you know how much water's flowing through your sewers. Unless you're actually doing an optimization of those pipes, you really don't need to know how much is flowing through in real time, um, unless you're planning on using them as storage, that sort of thing. 
So sometimes they, 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 we have to sort of step back and say, how does this data, how does this process associated with SMART achieve one water? Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'm going to call on you in just a second here. A bit. Sure. Uh, Kevin, uh, so you, your first part, you, you know, we need to smart one water. You got these silos of operation and different uh, components of the, of the water system. You need to break down the silos. And then I think your, your second comment was then you need to see what that collection of integrated people or, or uh, what they want and need. Um, you know, and, and then you t t gave a couple of examples of that. Is, is that a fair capture of the what you were, the points you were making? We, with 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 the missed example that once we have unified within the silos, we need to unify utilities with their partners who are in effect what we now call customers or clients or vendors. Um, you know. It, the whole goal of One Water is to create a unified uh, application for water in a way that, if because I came out of the energy industry, you know we, you know we we experienced how energy utilities fought tooth and nail against decentralized energy uh, generation, and eventually feed-in tariffs changed that whole discussion. And then we experience the reality of stranded assets. That's not an inconceivable reality in the water sector either. It's just going to take a lot longer to do. Our goal is to maintain the pinnacle infrastructure of, of clean drinking water, sanitation, and, and you know, fear from flood and drought. Uh, on a cost effective basis. And if we can't do that as public utilities, people are gonna do it for themselves and we're gonna strand public utilities and a whole lot of people who can't afford to do it for themselves. Thanks, data, Kevin. The whole goal of data is to identify how that process all works forward. Cool, thank you. You. And thanks a lot, everybody. The I think one of the main things that we probably really need to lean into for data and its value in this is the fact that uh, data in itself is really the elephant that most utilities cannot uh, chew piece by piece. And I think really what that tends to lean into is that it does not have a strategic focus in terms of implementing this and uh, where do you actually take it. Mm -hmm. I think one of the main benefits that can be brought from here is really uh, establishing a tiered framework in terms of how utilities engage in data transformation. Then that's usually one of the main areas that uh, tends to fall down because there's no real connection between uh, your data strategy and your strategic uh, plans and up. And it really needs to tie into how do you actually bring endpoint uh, value because then that's really what allows the stakeholders to buy in but also have the sustainability uh, framework to actually allow it to metastasize and move forward. So I think in that sense, one, uh, there are a couple of things that really um, actually need to uh, become structuralized. First of all, is really establishing what is mature data environments in utilities. I think that's really very undefined. Uh, we have several different things that are floating around, you know, everything from uh, the one water model to uh, integrated data platforms to ISO 55000. There's so many different things that are floating around and it really has, you know, uh, a divergence of strategies that then leave utilities very lacking in focus. Uh, I think for many, the problem really is, is in the fact that in the operational frameworks are so lacking in what would be operational insight even on the base level, just from the fact that even the information that's already available is not utilized in decision-making on an operational level, then those operational decisions are not strategically aligned. So I think even just getting that baseline uh, understanding to say that every utility is a very data-rich environment, but how do we tailor those utilities to actually utilize the data resources that they actually do have without creating a threshold of entry that's solely based on ma massive investment? Right, I think uh, that in itself, but also the one of the main hurdles and barriers, and I can speak to this, you know, uh, 
really running a data strategy for a large utility, which is emblematic of most utilities, uh, there really needs to be a playbook that allows key stakeholders, executive and beyond, really to understand why this is a necessary strategy to invest in, to sustain, and really to push going forward. Uh, and I think a lot of that is defined in the fact of what the need is. I think many times for utilities, because we're intrinsically closed market, uh, there tends to be this understanding that the business model does not need innovation. Uh, but I think one of the main roots of why data is important is because uh, the ecosystem that utilities land in is now incredibly saturated by other essential services that have been dynamic in their, up, in their adoption of technology and data. So the customer expectation has far out, re, outpaced mm -hmm. our capability to lean into that value. So uh, really what data offers, especially water utilities and municipal services at this point, is to really leverage beyond what is core service, not just turning the water on and flushing the toilet, but providing an added service, because that's the baseline expectation of all customers at this point. So in, instead of having data necessarily being viewed as only, uh, you know, an efficiency tool, it really should be viewed on how do you actually establish, retain market share going forward? Because I think the problem is we need to redefine what is market share for utilities. Most of them just see it as there's no competitor, but really what it is is that how do you gain that portion of the dollar for the service that that customer decides that they want to place value on? And without actually meeting the expectation of the redefined customer understanding where they're getting it from energy, they're getting it from gas, they're getting it from their ISP providers and everybody else who has redefined the customer experience for what is essential service, which is heavily data driven. Uh, I think framing it in that sense gives an added strategic leg that's currently not there that then allows it to be uh, something that stakeholders understand in a different framework where it's really more about um, a risk reduction perspective to say that this is how do we, we retain control and not only protect our market share going forward. And I think that is really the untold story of why data transformation and why ecosystems uh, inside utilities and collaboration uh, between utilities is important because really when you look on the pl plethora of technologies, it can be overwhelming for those who are not deeply immersed in it. But this tends to pull it all together in what would be a more uh, a strategic focal point that helps that. So really what I think personally what's really needed is that playbook that says, okay, this is why it's important. This is how you go about it. But then also these are the marginal deltas that you can get on your way to what is a mature state. Thank you. Mary's about to uh, hug you virtually here. Uh, Hugh, you how, great, Hugh. That was Hugh, really how, amazing. How has COVID-19, Hugh, um, changed your utility's perspective on digital transformation? So I think one of the great things about COVID-19 is that, uh, you know, I would say utilities have really been very you know, sheltered from change patterns, right? And COVID in itself is so intrusive is that what it has done is that it has really redefined the window of change, right? And I think that's the main thing. Uh, right now, because of the forced adoption of technology, it's not only with teleworking uh, and using other digital tools, which you, you were forced to adapt on a large scale, has really changed utilities perspective as to what is capable in terms of really optimizing processes. Uh, many of those things which were intrinsically institutionalized have now been forced to be reframed on a pure efficiency basis because the problem in itself required the most efficient solution. So what COVID has really done is that this is a very, I would think, the only window that we probably would have where we can leverage what is a redefined operational model on utilities now because uh, at this point the external factors have really removed what were the intrinsic barriers to get it done um, so i think that's really the the main focal point and i think really now uh, is when the time is necessary to define how do you get from point a to point b because many utilities have transformed but it was a, from an external force. They really don't understand how do they retain that value that has been built in, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and the, the tendency now is how do you prevent them to regress back to the previous normal versus transitioning to the new normal? Thank just, you. Go, Mary, go, go, you, would you give your affiliation? I should have asked you at the beginning. Oh, sure. I'm with uh, no. globalwaterworks.org. Um, 
Thanks, it's a clever Mary. community, but, um, and you guys are all invited to participate. But, uh, but what I heard you say last year was so exciting to me at SWIM, where we talked about engaging the customers and what's been broken until we fix that customer link and know how much they're using and know that they know what their consumption is and how they can improve on it. We're not going to fix water because we need um, the customer to be aware both the you know we come into the meters with the buildings and we come into the homes on general water use but they don't know that it's their toilet leak they don't know it's their outdoor irrigation that's their big um you know hit for water uh, and i just put in the link area there's an innovator out of switzerland that does water and use and energy and use it's drupal.io for 250 dollars for a home it's a new technology and the new enterprise-wide toilet monitoring there are these things that are out there that are available today that i think can drive that customer engagement plus also the efficiencies that we want so super thanks mary sure uh prabhu i'm going to call on you but you could you give us your affiliation too i forgot to ask you. um i'm sorry uh so keith sinclair i'm with wssc water thank you Probably. We saw you lift, you saw you raise your, you know, lift up your sleeves. You're ready to go. So what do you think? <laughs> yes. You know, you, you can never beat what uh -huh. you are below your stage, right? I mean, <laughs> mm. uh, I'm with Stantec. Um, and, uh, you know, we, what, I just wanted to say one thing, you know, I'm new definitely to this industry fairly and then being in this digital market only fairly recently. However, I was looking at a few reports as part of the Water Research Foundation project. There was a 1994 research project um, led by, I think, a AWWA and a Jap Japanese Water Research uh, Foundation. And if you went back and looked at it, uh, the, the, the issues that we are talking, geez, 25, 20 years, more than 20 years from now, 25 years from now, have exactly been the same thing. And the technology solutions that they offered were pretty much the same. They talked about data management, data governance, data quality, silos, all of those things did not change a bit. However, you know, the solutions may be a little more advanced and we have more, um, you know, cloud-based solutions now. The power of processing has definitely improved and the cost of processing has definitely gone down. But what hasn't changed at all is the people. In the organization and we, when we talk about silos right the silos are different in different organizations and if you notice how the silos are formed it's how they are organized in one organization you will see the utilities team and uh, probably the asset management are closely organized structurally and they have less silos there but in another utility where they are completely separate the silos are you know um, wider and um, uh, uh, clearly visible uh, and what I'm trying to say here is while we talk about technology and data cleansing, data integration, all those things, uh, if we really want to achieve one water, I mean, we need to think about how can we truly break down those silos. Literally, you know, um, even, even if you, I mean, I live in the DC metro region, sink, uh, you know, 30% of the flow goes from WSC to DC water. If we really want to achieve a one water, it has to be a watershed approach. And uh, I mean, you and you know how many jurisdictions are here, how many water utilities are here, uh, breaking down the silos internally from one utility to another utility, and politically, that's going to be the biggest challenge. I think the data is data management, cleansing, fairly an easy process once we break down um, the silos structurally. Uh, one last thing I want to say here is, you know, at the end of the day, if someone, you know, if all of us want to say that we are, we have smart, we have become smarter, is the day when the data source becomes irrelevant. When you are able to make the decisions you want to make without giving any consideration to your data sources, meaning you have truly integrated whatever you need to do. So that's one, you know, you talked about that. What is the future maturity? The maturity, the future maturity would be when data becomes irrelevant for your decision making. When the data source, not the data, but the data source becomes irrelevant when you, you know, talk about decision making. And um, I think uh, Kevin earlier mentioned about the business processes too. Uh, that's a key one. I think uh, it's people are starting to notice that, uh, meaning um, 
And there is a water research foundation project, UAM, I think a couple of uh, WSSC is a part of it, DC Water and um, 30 some utilities are part of it. The major focus of that research um, uh, is all about processes. So if you don't understand uh, how things are being done, we won't know where the decisions are being made and how they are being made. And we are helping one of our clients in terms of actually doing an enterprise-wide uh, business process um, mapping activity. Um, as simple as, you know, I was talking to them about as-built process. Everyone thinks that it's a GIS responsibility. <laughs> and then there's a construction, and GIS thinks it's a construction's responsibility. Nobody knows who is supposed to give them the final product where the GIS team or the data management team can finally update it. Just one example. Uh, but if we begin with the understanding, clear understanding of how things are being done uh, and map out and document those processes, it, be it becomes quite apparent where the inefficiencies are, you know, um, to do some quick wins. Plus also it allows people to identify what the data needs are for making a specific decision and identify where the current data sources are. And it also allows then for us to focus on integrating those data sources to make the decision again going back to why we are going why we need to make the decision i think mike, mike talked about too I, yeah you're collecting so much data what am i going to get out of it why do i need to get out you know integrate that data that question has to come from a specific business activity that that helps you do some decision making on the on a daily basis is it for cip optimization or sso reduction because for some communities sso is a big issue for other communities it's not a big issue so which ones you want to focus on? It goes back to what's um, what your strategic priority. That's what he was saying. It needs to come from the strategic priority of what your focus is and drive that, drive that down to what the business processes are to achieve that um, uh, strategic priority and then you know, map out where you need to get the data from to make the decisions that need to be made. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. You know, uh, it's come up here a number of times, breaking down the silos, the challenge of integrated water systems, and uh, certainly a, a decent chunk of that relates to governance uh, structures, uh, authority, um, you know, legal uh, arrangements. However, um, we can have information sharing, data sharing, collaboration, cooperation among units that would go far, even in the framework of uh, constraining, you know, legal frameworks. So uh, what, let's turn for the last uh, bit of our time here to the innovation ecosystem hub. So the, the water sector ecosystem is a big complicated thing. Uh, with many players uh, and in terms of what a university research center could do acting as a uh, as a hub as a collaboration site um, it, you know is, is limited we wouldn't necessarily be able to take on the entire ecosystem and and, and add any value and as I discussed uh, briefly in, in, in the preamble remarks that uh, there are e existing organizations, Water Research Foundation and others that are doing good work. So where are the opportunities, where are the, where are the gaps that could help us break down silos and you know, not necessarily force marriages because that's gonna take you know, new governance agreements and so forth, uh, and maybe there's some work the university could do to help on some of that. But in terms of collaboration sharing, it looks like you's got some thoughts here, please. Yeah, so one of the main things I think there's always been a gap. Um, you know, yes, we have those industry organizations, but one of the main things that we do not have is a clearinghouse or a repository that helps us to categorize what technologies are, where do they provide benefit for your organization, right? And the, the threshold of entry. So, uh, I think that resource is clearly needed uh, to give a more defined understanding as to what technologies are most appropriate for a provided solution, right? And what are some of the more 
peer reviewed baselines as to you know what can you extract out of this in terms of a benefit for your organization especially in the fact that many of these different technologies have minor nuances in terms of how they're different uh, but a lot of information that comes utilities are not necessarily very well equipped to filter through all of that information themselves and then also what happens is that the barrier for re-entry after making a major investment on one of these and not necessarily realizing what is the value then makes it much harder for any other uh you know technology implementation going forward so i think that repository uh that you know properly catalogs and has the not necessarily an overwhelming you know white paper based kind of uh, information but some clear straightforward baseline understanding as to this does x this does y these are the benefits that you can realize these are you know maybe some of the pitfalls in you know implementation and entry would really help uh and the fact is it from a university perspective it helps as well because it's it would be seen as a independent arbiter of this information yeah, Hugh, I, the clearing, I love the clearinghouse idea, and even to drive a little bit further, um, you know, the NSF could, the ESC could take a role on, on identifying really where is, where is the best area to focus funding on strategic research for smart one water, because what we see right now, I'll give, I'll give COVID-19 for wastewater uh, as an example. There's at least 10 different coalitions out there globally doing COVID-19 testing development uh, independent from each other and you know multiple universities working together but these 10 different groups why why don't we have a more of a, a focus to work together rather than in all these different groups trying to do it themselves uh, you could get to the solution a lot faster and you know so maybe maybe helping to focus where strategic research should be identifying who who would like to be involved in that and and provide some of the seed money as to leverage some of their other funding to do that. I think that would be that would be helpful as well. But you're you're right. It's just it's just randomly happening. It's there's a lot of good stuff happening across the industry, but it's very random. And I can't even tell you where stuff's happening either. And I'm I'm not a utility. I'm, I'm supposed to be doing the you know advising my clients on where the best stuff is. And there's just so many things happening that it's it's really there's no there's no focused clearinghouse to to, to understand that what well, what i do so hugh that's a very good point the clearing house it's um um it'll be def definitely valuable for the water community one challenge that i do see um i've noticed utilities have are about comparing the nuances right that's when it becomes really challenging and i've seen some successful in one utility versus the other utility right and if you actually dive down into why it was useful i mean it's a good example some places maximo is successful sometimes some places is not successful some people like city work some people don't like city work some people like hansen but if you actually dive down after having conversation with a couple of utilities you notice that it's about the ability for the utility to configure it properly most of these solutions have the functionalities the basic functionalities are most of the things that how you do things, maybe it's a little different how you program it, but the functionalities are there. The configuration occurs um, at the utility level. It's the ability to fully understand how they can take the advantage of the solutions is key. And um, if, you if uh, universities can help utilities with them, um, bringing that kind of a mindset, you know, configuration of a solution is as important as just evaluating these solutions. If we don't configure after you purchase a product, it may not serve you well and you will become, um, they, if people get frustrated with it and they want to after three, four years. And that's one of the reasons of what we are seeing with utilities being going through the cycles of technology purchase, five years, they go through one purchase and then they get fed up with it. Maybe it's because, I don't know if it's because of one solution, it's probably because of the configuration of the solution to their needs. That's something that I think as a, it would be beneficial for utilities to um, uh, get trained on. You know, how do you configure, why configuration, what does it mean by that? How many people are being you know, trained to fully leverage the solutions out there? Part of that though probably is the fact that nobody is able to define what is smart water. And, and that's really 
the the main crux of this is like nobody knows when you've cleared a certain threshold or are you even you know are you at kindergarten level elementary tertiary level and i think that in itself creates this constant cycle of reinventing what is progress uh where this could actually have a benefit is that if we could define the thresholds of what do you actually need to move yourself forward in some proficiency that would help and the core technologies that are involved in that not necessarily a specific one but just a core set of capabilities that you should have you know you, you that's a very good point you know um uh i think it, it would probably also be different for different utilities i think most of them have some level of the capabilities right customer service is a good example everyone needs customer service but utility defines what it means to them if i am able to do this to my customer i am good right and the depend that that's what drives the maturity um i'm saying this only because after reviewing there are outside of the water water industry, we have tons of framework. I can probably know <laughs> some of them too from the previous. <laughs> you would just, oh my God, if you, I can name five different digital transformation frameworks. Industry 4.0, oh my God, 20, at least 20 easily tops from the German side and the European market. There are many uh, capability frameworks and maturity levels have been identified. Uh, and developed and constantly being, I mean, we're, we're developing one right now, right? But it, it ultimately boils down to every utility going through that understanding of what it means to them. And it goes back to what you were saying earlier. What is their strategic priority? How does, how do that, how does it mean to what everyone does? You know, that if that conversation doesn't happen, and as Ken was pointing before, that setting up that uh, the team within the utility, who kind of you know more like a community of practice, right, or a community of excellence team that works together to improve all these things, makes sense out of strategic priority all the way to the data level. It's going to be challenging, and um, um, it, it's similar to you know I think I talked to before too. Is we're talking to someone earlier about. You know, having a smartphone doesn't make the person smarter at all, right? You can walk up the most <laughs> advanced iPhone with your hand. It, it's still not going to make, if you don't know how to configure the apps, you know, how to use it, uh, use different apps, uh, how to transfer information from your <laughs> Google Cloud to the other places. It's not going to make you smarter or, or where to go find that information. Same thing, you know, it's really are composed of a platform of uh, some infrastructure, which will have multiple apps in it for different applications. But until you know what decisions you need to make, you won't be able to develop those applications. And it's gonna be different. Uh, and um, it is going to be quite hard. I'm not trying to be pessimistic here, but it is going to be quite hard to standardize, um, um, you know, as an industry, all of this. Um, it'll be a while until people and organizations break the silos down. Well, um, thanks, thanks, Prabhu. So this is a good discussion here of uh, how uh, clearinghouse for technologies with some component of evaluation on them, which is it's, it's challenging to do. In the 1990s, uh, I was doing a bunch of research related to site remediation, groundwater treatment, and that kind of thing. There were a whole host of technologies coming on online. And similar recommendation was made to the EPA at the time. What could the EPA Office of Research and Development do to help, help communities and companies think about and understand these technologies? And there was a program that was developed, the SITE program, Superfund, Superfund Innovative Technology Evaluation Program. And it uh, put different technologies through common challenges, uh, technical challenges. And then the, the data were just published. There weren't opinions made about what was good, what was bad. Uh, but th th that's, uh, it was a contribution, uh, expensive, couldn't touch a whole, you know, a, a humongous set of technologies, but maybe there's a framework to do something like that. Uh, let, let me just, we just have a couple of minutes remaining here on the innovation ecosystem hub. What are some other uh, opportunities for value adds 
to bring to, to improve coordination to break down the silos and uh, maybe I'd ask uh, Mike Stir, who has uh, some I, I presume you've been in the business quite a while and uh, an experience with interacting with uh, other utilities, uh, vendors, uh, cus uh, customers, the public. Um, what are some other opportunities that a university research center could, uh, could do to improve connections and to 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 try out connections and partnerships to try to to try out some new approaches. So, a couple of comments on in that regard. Have I unmuted myself? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, first of all, we spend an awful lot of time talking about silos, and I think that's kind of baloney. Most of it. Um, Human beings organize. And when we reorganize, it's merely an organization. And then we, we, when we get frustrated with that organization, we call it a silo. Um, so I've always tried to focus more on process and participation than what the org chart looks like. Because if you bust the silo, you have just created another one. That's what happens because we're human beings. We organize to do things and then we get tribal about it. Um, so I, I focus less on, on busting silos than I do on being right participation and so on. Um, something that I, if you'll note right now, the, the folks on this call, there, I think there's only two of us that are from utilities. And both of us are from big utilities. And the smaller utilities in Portland, Oregon might be right at the edge of between big and little. I think we belong to AMWA, but that's the big 40. We're probably number 39. But you get below that organization level and you have not got much bandwidth from management. You just don't. So that makes that difficult and you have to deliberately focus on how to help the small guy. And if you don't do that, um, it, won't, it won't happen. An example of a good effort, I think, is, is the swim center, but the participation is all voluntary. Well, why do we vol volunteer to uh, participate? Um, there. My wife got it. good for her. Um, why do we volunteer to participate? Because I see value in it. And the pipe data thing that they are doing right now, that Sunil and Kathy, if she's she's in here because we're not in the big group, but are doing right now has got a huge number of utilities to participate and cough up uh, data, and and to also work at purifying it. And I think that's a really good thing. And I'm. I'm sorry, I don't have a better idea than that, but you have to be able to persuade someone to participate and, and then do something that appeals. I'm, I'm a really bottom line guy. I love technology like anybody else, but I was a taskmaster with my staff. You're gonna have to show me what decision I'm gonna make off this data before you can collect it, because it costs a flipping fortune to collect and maintain data. So I think efforts like the Swim Center, the Pipe ID Project, uh, which is sponsored by the Bureau of Reclamation, but I think there's something like 500 utilities have, have coughed up some amount of data of some variable quality. It's what we all had uh, for that effort. And, and it will get better over time, I think. But I think that's, that's what I would, would look at and I focus less on on silos and more on participation. Anyway, Excellent. enough. Thank you, Mike. And, and, and on a talk, <laughs> on a need that people care about. Sounds like the like the the, the pipe uh, asset management tool. A absolutely. 
you know, if I could do one thing for my utility, which I, I don't belong to anymore, if I had a pile of money, I'd give them a check for $35 million to put an AMI system in the city of Portland, because that is the best thing I could do for my customers. They think they want to know where the pipes are and all that stuff. Well, I don't want to tell them because I don't want them digging them up. But AMI, how to manage your own little little piece of water, that's what I would do. That would so benefit. Here, here to you, Mike. I, what, one of the biggest positive things data gives us the ability to do is create a bridge, which is two way between utilities and their mm -hmm. outer entities, whether they're vendors or or you know users, uh, but that I think if to answer Ken's question or was it Dave's question about what do we want out of the, the um, sort of like the clearinghouse vendor or sorry, um, uh, uh, governance uh, models are probably one of the most important things that you know, small, medium and even large utilities need because much as I, uh, understand where you're coming from mike the you know from from the outside view of a utility particularly from a governance point of view you see a lot of utilities who believe they're leaders or innovators but who stubbornly refuse to do a b c or d or whatever it is for for whatever reason um and and there's a burning desire you know of always somebody to do that uh, or there is a good reason to do it. I think the the point isn't that anybody is either right or wrong about all this, and data is not the holy grail answer to everything. But where you said being able to make a bridge to your 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 partner uh, participants or the people who buy our services, those are the most important people we need to provide true transparency to. And like you said about AMI. You took the words right out of my mouth because AMI is a good example. Uh, we all know about Fathom, the AMI company that failed. They didn't fail because their, their AI was crappy. They failed because their customer relationship 